Those are the beneficial reasons of this because tonight there are two persons for this occasion. Uh, there are no calories in these refreshments. So enjoy. <laughs> cool. Thank you, sir. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. That was number one item tonight. Number two item is the presentation of a participant in this program in an earlier evening. Gertrude Henschel, would you please stand up so everybody can express their appreciation? Since this is the final night of this series, since we're out in the Pacific at this stage of the war, since there were thousands and thousands of men there, and women, <coughs> first I'll mention the Air Corps, but a lot of Navy personnel, a lot of Army personnel, a lot of specialists, one of them is a CB. You may not know what a CB is or was. I don't know. Glenn, does the Navy still have CBs? As far as I know, they still have a small contingent, yes. All right, these men were engineers, builders. They went into remote areas and develop them for military use. I personally had an opportunity to be assigned to an outfit that was attached to Army Corps of Engineers. And I couldn't believe what those fellows accomplished. A lot of their tasks was successful because they improvised, and I'm sure that the Seabees had to improvise and make do with what they had. Our first participant tonight is a veteran of World War II CB. Let me introduce Glenn Kingman. compliment Phil Wood and Dr. Kenny for the wonderful job that they have done in putting these classes together and you the students who have paid so much attention to us old men and we hope you will bear with me on this. I uh, want to say one thing. I belong to three veterans organizations from the Veterans of Foreign Wars, which is a combat organization, combat veterans. And I have never, never heard the stories that I have heard since this thing started. We don't, uh, we don't talk about it. I, I think probably some of you might have heard or have an idea that all the old vets do is sit around the bar and tell war stories. It isn't so. We don't talk about it. A lot of things that you'll hear tonight, I'm sure from I and Dick Hannon, uh, that our own families have never, never heard. I uh, did make a diary when we <clears throat> went into combat. When we arrived at Bougainville, and I probably haven't read that thing twice in 50 years, but I got it out to help me with this class so that I could uh, intelligently talk about it and give you uh, dates and so forth that it actually it's pretty hard for an old 77 year old man to stand up here in front of you and remember things that happened 53 years ago just out of the blue. So 
when Pearl Harbor, <coughs> the Jap Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor, December 7, 1941, I was working out here at Kellner's Dairy, which no longer exists, and the uh, owner was Conrad Kellner, some of you old, older folks remember that he was the mayor of Rensselaer at that time. And I and a man named Johnny Downs, uh, when, the, when the Pearl Harbor was hit by that sneak attack, we were mad, mad as the devil, which a lot of you were. And we decided that we were going to enlist. And we had heard stories about the CBs, didn't know a thing about them. There was a man here named Jack Miller, and uh, he was recruiting for the CBs. He was doing a heck of a cell job on them. We went up to the <coughs> courthouse and, and uh, asked about it. He gave us a good story and pointed out all the good things about it. And we signed up. We went back to Mr. <laughs> Kellner and we told him that we were, we were going to go. And he hit the roof. He, he said, I need you fellows. They're taking every young man out of, out of the uh, county and all over. And he said, I can't get help. He said, I have, uh, you know, you're engaged in dairying. We milked a herd of cows, delivered milk door to door, went out in the country and picked up milk, brought it in. And, and uh, Oscar Putman, who has recently passed away, uh, did the, all the pasteurizing work. And uh, he said, now, fellas, I can go to the draft board and get you fellas deferred. He said, our operation is necessary to the war effort. And uh, he said, well, we'll uh, get you deferred. We didn't like the word deferment. And we didn't listen to him, although there were times afterward, and I thought about that <laughs> and wished, wished that I would have listened to Mr. Kellner a little closer. Uh, we went down to uh, Indianapolis and were inducted. I and Delbert Williams, the only one Delbert, Johnny Downs, and we uh, we were inducted. Little little joke I can tell about that, I tried to get in the Navy when I was 17 years old. And I went down to the recruiting office in Indianapolis. The first thing the fellow that asked me, he said, what color is that chair over there? And I said, I think it's greener, I think. He said, you think? He said, I'll tell you, you can go across the street. And Army, Army uh, recruiters don't, uh, they take people that uh, are colorblind. I said, oh, I'm not colorblind. But uh, when, after Pearl Harbor and, uh, and we, uh, I went down as I, <clears throat> as I said, was inducted. And they gave me that same test. All those dots and so forth flashed a book at me. They said, you passed with flying colors. They needed, <laughs> they, they needed men at that time. <laughs> so, so I got in and, and uh, we, we were sent back home for, uh, uh, let's see, from January, from January, is when we were inducted, and uh, this was in 1942. And uh, in August, we were called up. And, uh, we went to, from Indianapolis, we went to uh, uh, Camp Bradford, which is near Norfolk, Virginia. And uh, we were, got into Bradford about Oh, I don't know what time it was, but it was getting dark. And it was pouring rain, raining cats and dogs. We all got off of that, we all got off of that, those buses. The buses took us from the train yards to, to camp. And I don't remember whether we had anything to eat. Maybe we had sandwiches on the bus. We must have had, because we did weren't offered anything there. And we were all herded into a big building. And uh, there were between 1,000 and 1,100 men. And there was a tough old chief petty officer who had been a Marine drill instructor. And uh, he stood up there on the platform in front of us and he told us that 
said, you people are supposed to be specialists. I wasn't. I was too young, really. Our average age in our battalion, by the way, was 37 years of age. And uh, he said, you, <coughs> you know, you've got a job to do, but he said, your job will be done under fire. And he said, we, you're going to run into an enemy over there that it has one purpose in mind, and that's to kill you. Well, I'll tell you, he scared the hell out of me, and, and that, that is one of the times that I wished I'd have listened to Mr. Kelman. <laughs> but we went ahead then, and we got our issue, and he told us, he said, you're going to be subject to this, to, we don't have time. Time is of the essence here, and he said, you uh, uh, will learn to take care of yourself under fire, and uh, you'll learn a lot in three, years, in three months. And they did. They turned us over to the U.S. Marine Corps, and they put us through the mill. They taught us weapons, uh, automatic weapons, close order drill, marches, full pack, and steel helmets, and the whole works. And, uh, we went then from, we did our boot in Bradford, and uh, that didn't mu ma amount to much make a fool out of it, we thought so anyway. It was a real tough, tough drill, getting up at 4 o'clock in the morning and peeling a lot of potatoes, doing a lot of policing up the area, everything they could think of. We did, and, and then we went to Camp Perry, which is near Norfolk for our basic training. There we did a lot more physical things and getting in shape and so forth. And then we were sent out to uh, <coughs> Port Miami, California. And there we continued on. And I know they asked us if any of us out there, if any of us, of course they had our records too that could go back to, but if we'd had any military training at all. National Guard or whatever, and I was in the National Guard for three years. And there was a platoon picked out of that uh, group at, uh, uh, by an uh, ex-Marine uh, DI named Bob Carey. And we were put on security detail. And we posted guard and, and that sort of thing. That continued on and overseas for a while. And uh, the boys all uh, called us carriage canaries, <laughs> and <laughs> we didn't mind. But uh, when we were, we were shipped overseas and uh, went to Espirito Santos in the Hebrides Islands for a while, uh, there was no action there. There had been, in fact, there was a boat, or a, a ship, I think it was a, probably a, a, a cruiser that was a mayor U.S. that was sunk out in the harbor. We could see that. The water is clear. You can see down for a long, long way. And uh, then we stayed there for quite a <clears throat> quite a long time. I've got ahead of my head of my notes here. I'm doing a little well. Excuse me, Glenn, could you speak a little louder please? Can't you hear me, Phil? You got a bullhorn? I don't know about the back row. <laughs> Well, if I was back here, I know I couldn't hear because I can't hear very well. Um, yeah, I'll try. Um, we go along here uh, in January of 1943. Uh, I was shipped to Esperito Santos in the New Hebrides group. After a while, we, after a short stay, we proceeded to the Russell Islands and then to Bougainville and the Solomons. Bougainville was a large island approximately 50 miles by 125 miles. The American troops and New Zealand Air Force only had, held a beachhead four miles deep and eight miles in length. The rest of the island was infested with Japanese who were desperate. I took a short look in a, in a, in a, in a, a U.S. Uh, military history book at the library yesterday and they said it's, it stated that there were 50,000 Japanese garrison there. And uh, our men, and God bless the 3rd Marine Division, 
they took the uh, took the beachhead and, and held four miles deep and eight miles long. And this is what we operated out of. What we operated our our airstrips. There was a Japanese airstrip there when we arrived that was all bombed out. They fixed that up and they used that for a fighter strip. Uh, we did it, and uh, then we uh, we built we built a large large bomber strip there, and uh, the Japanese were their supply lines were cut off by the United States Navy and Air Force. Uh, the beachhead was taken and secured by the 3rd Marine Division November the 1st, 1942. They suffered heavy, heavy casualties. I arrived at the Empress Augusta Bay beachhead on an LST, that's landing ship tank. Uh, Bob Conley uh, discussed that uh, he was an officer on that. And uh, with a 36 CB battalion in the second echelon. There were many wounded Marines brought on board before we landed on the beachhead. Uh, how many of you here have heard of the CBs? Quite a few. Quite a few. And uh, we immediately moved inland to the site where we were to build a bomber airstrip and set up camp. Ten days after, our D-8 cats poked the first <coughs> hole in the dense jungle. A Marine captain fighter pilot made a couple of passes at the beginning of the new landing strip. Can you hear me now, Phil? Yes, sir. <laughs> okay. He made a successful landing and shook hands with us and took off. These young fellas would amaze you. The kids that flew these fighter planes with these bombers over there. There was a bomber come in on the strip there at Bougainville uh, once. And he, I could tell he was shot up. I think it was up. I believe it was a liberator, <clears throat> 24 in the field. And uh, they, they got out of that airplane, and they were kids now. They looked like looked like high school that night with packs on their backs. <laughs> they had some of them just little fuzz on their chin. And like I say, it, it, it was amazing. And uh, one of them, they took a hit, and uh, a lot of smoke in the in the plane, and, and uh, one of them got excited and bailed out. I don't know how he got the door open or how, how, but he got out of it, right over enemy territory. God only knows what happened to him. And uh, these young pilots, they, they like to be the first to land on a new strip. Uh, we landed on Bougainville November 28, 1943 and began to build a bomber airstrip almost immediately. Everyone pitched in and worked hard to get it completed in order to knock out the air installations that the enemy were operating bomber, bombing raids on us from. Uh, Rabal in the uh, New Britain Highlands, that was only about 100, 150 miles up, 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 and the Japs occupied it. And uh, by New Year's Day, we had uh, a, a, a C-47 landed on the new strip. And a few days later, B-17s and B-25 bombers were operating on it day and night. Now the following excerpts are taken in part from a sketchy diary that I made when we left the Russell Islands and headed for Bougainville. Now, some of this is pretty serious stuff. It even scares me all over again. <laughs> it's pretty graphic in some of the terms I'd like to say to the students today would probably, that I use for the Japanese, for the enemy, are pretty graphic and probably wouldn't be, and political uh, correctness wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be filled bill today. But you got to remember that this was 53 years ago and that the Japanese were our mortal enemy at that time. So 
before I get started on that. When I was on the Russell Island, I wasn't going to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. <laughs> I had some time there, and I wrote a little poem. And when I read this poem to you, you'll probably realize that I'm not a uh, much better poet than I am a public speaker. But we'll do it anyway. This is owed to a CB. You can have your army khaki, but I'll take my navy blue. So there's, here's to another great new fighter that I'll introduce to you. His uniform is somewhat different, the best that you will see. The Japs call him commando, but he is only a CB. His home is any sea bag on land, sea, and in the air. And you'll see, you'll soon see how the Japs will yell when he gets in their hair. He is trained in old Virginia, the land that God forgot, where the mud is 14 feet deep and it snows a hell of a lot. <laughs> he has set a thousand tables and only a dish he's dried, and many a dish he's dried. Uh, he's had to learn to make a bed with a mop he could surely guide. He's peeled a million onions and twice as many spuds and spends his spare time washing out his dirty duds. Now all you gals just take this tip that I'm going to give you. Just get yourself a CB. There's nothing that he can't do. In fact, uh, CB's motto is can do. Uh, and, and when he gets to heaven, to St. Peter, he will tell another CB reporting, sir, I've served my time in hell. <laughs> We embarked at about 4 p.m. in Manica, Russell Islands, probably headed for Bougainville. Before losing sight of land, we made up a convoy of eight LSTs and ran up garage balloons to protect us from enemy aircraft. The gun crew was short-handed, so having had automatic weapons schooling, I was appointed gunner on the number 150 on the caliber on the fan table. About 1800, 6 p.m. All of the gun, ship's guns crews tested and cleared their guns. That was a big kick for me, holding a, that 50 trigger down, watching those tracers go through the explosion puff of the big gun in the turret. All went well that night and through the next day until about 1500, 3 p.m. We were talking about what a quiet trip we were having and when an enemy plane dove on the ship next to us. I ripped the cover off my gun, had it trained on him before he got out of sight, but got no orders to fire. He dropped one 500-pounder, but missed the ship by 100 yards. We saw no more of him. He landed, we landed at Bougainville at dawn. This is Bougainville, Asiatic Pacific, November the 28th, 1943. And this is headed that, but this is November 29th then. Last night was a very memorable night, I believe for all of us. It was our first night on Bougainville, our first experience amidst the hell called war. We knew we were only three quarters of a mile from the front lines and we were pretty jittery. At about 21.30, 9.30, I, I heard a shot and a long, low wail close by. I knew someone had been hit hard. It was one of my close friends. He only lived for about 15 minutes killed reportedly, reportedly by a Jap sniper. Red, J.D., Curly, and I all wedged ourselves in a small foxhole and never moved from day <coughs> I said, uh, I underlined reportedly there because it turned out that this man had been posted on rolling sentry, which the Marines had cautioned us when we came in and told our CO to not post a moving sentry, that it would be murder to do it. And we had a fellow posted on a, on a pile of galley supplies, groceries and so forth, up on top, sitting up on top. Evidently that man went to sleep. And I heard halt and, and a shot immediately. And it turned out the next morning that for a so-called friendly fire. And there's a lot of that goes on, and it's gone on in all wars. And it's a tragedy. It's a real shame. It's, it's people that are, are uh, 
I don't know, it's not a lack of training, it's, it's their makeup. And they get, the adrenaline, adrenaline gets to pushing and they're scared to death and see something move and shoot. And that's what happened in that case. But uh, <coughs> this is Asiatic Pacific, December 14th. Last night we had at least 12 alerts in half that many bombings. This morning we picked up Akak shrapnel around their dugout. They threw everything at Tojo, and this is one of the terms that I use to describe the Japanese. But only Tojo, Haideki Tojo was their warlord. He was their commander in chief of the armed forces at that time. Emperor Hirohito, he sat back in his palace and, and uh, he, was, he was the emperor and, and was still the emperor after the war until he died. That was one of the provisions of the surrender that he not be bothered because they, they worshipped Hirohito. They gave their lives for thousands and thousands of their, of their, of their, of their soldiers. But uh, only exceeded, they only ex succeeded in knocking down one plane. He blew up with a hell of a flash and went into the water. This morning our artillery has given them heck in the hills. Um, told you bombed the hell out of the beach last night. 37 casualties were reported this morning, but that number was not confirmed. Anyway, several of our boys were killed and, and two Higgins boats were sunk. They got three Japanese planes in formation in the searchlights, but could not reach them with the ACAC fire. It was a pretty sight. The P-38s got on their tail and they, they didn't come back. Today, this is kind of repeating that I told you about first, about the first plane landing. Today, the first plane landed on our new strip only 10 days since we started punching a hole in the dense jungle. It was a German hell, Hellcat. Of course, a bomber can't land on her yet, but it won't be long. Mm -hmm. uh, we can see them bombing and strafing the Japs in the hills. They are dumping barrels of high-test gas on them and following up with incendiary bombs, roasting them very effectively. Uh, Last night, the Japs managed to bring up a seven close enough up to the shell of the beach. Our artillery soon got the range on them and laid up the biggest barrage that I've ever seen. They knocked out, they knocked them out in short order. The shells roaring through the air sounded like a thousand planes flying high. Periodical artillery fire goes on night and day. It did keep me awake, but I'm used to it by now. You never get used to it. Last week, the Marines made another push and used flame for the throwers very effectively. They say one scream, and that's the end of two. Uh, this morning, this is December 24th, the day before Christmas. This morning, just after having a couple of air raids, we had the heaviest earthquake that I've ever seen. It was about 6 a.m. The ground seemed to rotate and the trees whipped back and forth and we were in the child line and a lot of fellows ran. I started to run, but I decided I couldn't outrun an earthquake, so I stood still. It was like being on a rough sea in a small boat. No damage was recorded. We have had several small tremors since morning. This is December 26, 1943. Christmas has passed and it was a better day for us than some of us had expected. We laid steel on the strip in the morning. I went to mass in the afternoon. The service was simple and beautiful. Even though the shells were flying overhead and we had to kneel in the mud, we didn't mind. We, we had a very good chow in the evening and along with cold beer. We even had a Santa Claus and an imitation Christmas tree. And there was a battalion party held with entertainment by some of the more talented members. The best surprise of the evening was when our CO told us that we might get to come home soon. And this is December the 28th. This morning I went to the front lines at a point known as 600 A. The 21st Marines hit it only a few days ago. They lost quite a few lives, but shot hell out of the nips and took the position. They, uh, dead or buried shallow, and the place has a horrible stench. 
They haven't had time to cover some of the dead Japs yet. The uh, two young Marines showed me, uh, showed us the graves of their buddies buried wherever they fell, with rude crosses made of their rifles and their mess kits for a nameplate. They also always, always put the dog tag on on the ones that had fallen so they could be identified later. We never were without that dog tag. In fact, I've got it right here. Uh, <clears throat> every standing tree and snag up there was riddled with bullet holes. It's not a pleasant sight or one easily to be forgotten. New Year's Eve, January the 1st, 1944. Yesterday, the first transports landed on our new strip, on our strip. There were C-47s, 10 of them. The pi pilots commented very favorably on our strip and said it was the finest and fastest completed strip in this part of the Pacific. We are proud of our job here and elsewhere. We had an air raid during the night, January 1st, but no damage was reported. Today, a B-24 made an emergency landing on the fighter strip. She was badly shot up, and three of the crew were dead from enemy fire. She collided with a Corsair that was taken off, but neither pilot was injured badly. January the 5th, one of our boys was killed on the job this morning. We were clearing timber and a tree fell on him. He is the second man in our outfit to lose his life from the same cause in the past few days. The funeral services were held at 1400. I attended with quite a few others. A deceased man is Stephen Early and he was from Indiana. The boy who lost his life last week was a fellow named Jack Raffles. It doesn't seem right for swell fellows like these to have to go that way, but I guess things like that are too deep for our minds to comprehend. January the 13th, 1944. Last night, one of Tojo dive bombers came in over the Torquino Mountains and the radar failed to pick him up. Two of us were standing guard at the bomber strip, and the first warning we had was when he was diving. The ceiling was very low. And however, and he missed the strip by a quarter of a mile. Uh, no damage. No damage was done. About an hour later, we heard a plane coming in towards the strip. Anti-aircraft opened up on him, just above us. And I believe I broke a world speed record for getting to a bomb shelter. But it proved to be one of our own Vega Venturas who were coming in for a landing and had forgotten to turn the running lights on. Damage to him was very slight. 43 <coughs> enemy planes were shot down here in Aquata Canal last night. You know, we got reports. We got reports on these numbers and so forth. Whether they're exactly right or not, I, I don't know. But then that's what the <coughs> it was reported. Last night, Gail Sharp and I were on duty at the strip. As usual, about midnight, the siren sounded, and about 15 minutes later, Tojo dropped one bomb in the, at the far end of the taxiway. We took shelter in the hole, and he circled the field, and seemed as though he was going to dive right into our foxhole. The bomb struck at the edge of the strip about 500 yards from us, and the next alert sounded at 4.30 a.m., 4.30 He dove in again, and again. On, a, on our end of the strip, and this time, we really buried our faces in the dirt. These, these bombers, these Betty bombers they call them, the Japanese, they were more interested in, in hitting the airstrip than they were hitting personnel to, to keep our bombers from taking off and, and falling the heck out of them on up. Uh, he hit the strip dead center with a magnesium incendiary bomb. The fire was soon extinguished. That one missed us by about 200 yards, too close for comfort. The damage to the strip was repaired by one of our crews in about four hours. The TBFs, that's torpedo bomber fighters, uh, two of them were damaged. Uh, a siren blew this morning at 4.20 a.m. The Army has a pair of 50 caliber machine guns set up on Twin Mountain near my post at the strip. They have no one to man them, so I had 
I had permission to man them during a raid. This morning, when they picked up <coughs> the enemy plane and the lights, he was almost directly overhead and within range. I opened fire and really got a, got a hammering away at him, even though I probably didn't hit him. The 90 millimeters opened up on high and scored. He went down out to the sea. Those, there was 90 millimeters, that anti-aircraft group with a, with a black with a black outfit. And uh, they, they were known for accuracy. They, they, they really give the, the Japs fits when they come in on a bombing run. Uh, I want to take a little time here to <clears throat> describe uh, a battalion of men that we I met, had the privilege to meet over on Bougainville. They were under British command, and they were the first Fiji battalion. They were people from Fiji that had been picked, really picked, and screened, and, and uh, they made a scouting battalion out of them. That was their main purpose. I, I had a Jeep and I'd run around and had access to a Jeep and I'd, I'd, when I was off duty, well, I'd run around a little bit, visit and so forth and I pulled into this Fiji outfit and I saw a cobbler shop there and I always carried a 45 and I had a holster that was old and scuffed and ripped a little bit and I walked over and I asked this, this fellow spoke English light-skinned. He turned out his father was Australian and his mother was a Fijian. And he gave me an awfully lot of information on those people. And I asked him if he could fix my holster. Sure, no problem. He sewed it right up for me. Got to talking. And it wound up, after a few visits, he wanted to know if he could write to a girl in America. I knew him in the address. I said, sure. My wife's youngest sister, I don't know, she was just out of high school. <laughs> and I had written, I wrote to her and told her she was going to hear from this man, nice fellow. No, he was a good looking son of a He sent her his picture and she sent him hers. And they corresponded for a while and one day he I don't know, I think we got to hold maybe a couple of bottles of Australian beer or something. We kind of joined ourselves there and he grabbed a hold of me and he said, Kingman, when this is over, I'm going to America. I said, you are? Yeah. He said, I'm going to marry Helen. I thought, oh. <laughs> I, 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 I really stepped in it now. But, uh, it turned out that the correspondence dwindled, and I think I sent word. And, uh, I don't know. <laughs> it, it, it got over with, but they did exchange photos and, and so forth. And he told me an awfully lot about this outfit. And I met their commanding officer. Their commanding officer had been educated in, in, the, in the state of Washington, university graduate. <laughs> spoke perfect English and just a nice, nice man. But he was a tough, tough man, too. And the officers over there, after a scouting uh, venture, they come back in. They hadn't lost anybody, and they never did lose a man that I knew. And they would throw one heck of a party. Everybody's happy and, and celebrating and the victory and all that. And those officers would mingle with their men uh, much, much more than, than our people did and at that time. But then when the party was over and everything, everything went back to very strict discipline. I went over one Sunday. And it reminded me of a redress review over called the Military Academy years and years ago. Uh, they over there were all in uniform and everything was pressed and so forth. And their officers were <coughs> Australian and British, mostly. 
all but the commander, and he was a full blood Fiji. And boy, that was really something to see. And I think that's what made them such the kind of fighters they were. And I'll go into this now. And yesterday I visited two of my friends in the Fiji scout camp. The platoon had just returned from about 50 miles behind the enemy lines. They were trapped by the Japs, but shot and slashed their way out, killing 500 Japs and not losing a single man. One boy of about 20 was pointed out to me. He had a bloody bandage around his head and looked tired, but he was still smiling and walking around. He was credited with killing 150 Japs in about an hour and a half. It's time. And the, Jap, the Japanese, and they made those bonsai attacks, they just came in mass at you. And I, I this sounds far-fetched, but I believe it. I believe it. Uh, he didn't say it, he didn't say a word, but this Ernie Turner, this friend of mine, the cobbler was telling me. And he, he's a brand machine, brand machine gunner. They could mow them down. And said, these boys have been offered all the liquor they want for $50 a man for each Japanese that they bring in alive for questioning by intelligence. But they seem insulted when asked about taking live prisoners. Their, their skin may be dark, but they're the whitest men on the inside that I've ever met. They marched through the bush after that foray for two days and nights without food or water. Japs began, this is, goes up to, I said this was sketchy, and it is. Um, this jumps February, goes into March, March the 8th, 1944. The Japs begin shelling us at 6 o'clock a.m. Can you hear me, Phil? Maybe he went to sleep. <laughs> there he is. Not in the back. I thought you was in the back of the room. <laughs> Uh, Japs begin shelling us at 6 o'clock a.m. sharp. We've been expecting it for several days. They have been organizing for a week or so up in the past. And our dive bombers have been bombing and strafing them continuously. We can see it all plainly from our location. And it looks as though our power should be able to annihilate them. But they all have those caves in the mountainside to their advantage. We're expecting a push or a desperate attempt on their part to take beachhead. They want it back. Our battalion and every outfit on the beachhead have a defense line set up just in case. I have a machine gun position between the bomber and fighter, fighter strip. We were at Chow when the shells started falling. The first garage struck a course airplane at the edge of our camp and burned it. The ammunition in it sounded like popcorn exploding for a good half an hour. Two planes were reported burned and eight damaged. One shell exploded beside a moving truck front of our camp and killed two and injured several others badly. It wasn't a pretty sight. There was a half inch of blood and gore in what was left in the bed of the truck. It I took my truck over to the heavy equipment area to get it out of the way and I saw a buddy of mine sticking his head up out of the ditch. He ducked and yelled at me and I threw myself flat and the shell came close enough and this is actually did that I felt the air hurt my shirt. And Thank God it was a duck. It didn't go off. It landed out here and dug itself into the <clears throat> ground. It didn't explode. If it had, I wouldn't have been writing. I wouldn't have been writing this now. When I got in the ditch, I laughed about it. But five minutes later, I was shaking so bad I couldn't light a cigarette. Things are quiet now, but we never know when they will open up again. The Japs poured in a barrage last night about 7:30. They had a range. One shell bursted in a big tree almost directly overhead. Kurt Johnson in the tent beside ours was hit in the thigh and the shrapnel went clear through. The next one hit directly behind our hole. Our tent is full of shrapnel holes. The concussion is terrific when one lands close. The shelling got kept up off and on all night, so we didn't get much sleep. Uh, explained a little bit about the rough, the jungle and so forth over there, but they had an awfully lot of those big, you know, some of you have been there, you fellows in the back there have, uh, seen these big banyan trees. And it's, there's just an awfully lot of them, they're a huge tree, and then the jungle vines may be 
uh, maybe four inches or so or six uh, in diameter and they lace these trees for, for miles and when you pull one down which our dozers did build airstrip he jerks those you know jerk those limbs off and it's dangerous as all get out for guys that's working on the ground and that's how those two fellows that i told you about got killed earlier they, they weren't cat skimmers but they limbs fell on them and got them and the shells would hit these trees they may be 120 150 feet high and the shells would hit in the tops of those trees and explode down. And I saw a hole in my mosquito net this morning and upon the investigation I found that a piece of shrapnel had gone through my net, uh, through my double blanket which was on the head of my bed, on through my bed and through an inch board and three inches into the sand. It was in, I was in my hole across from our bunk and a uh, piece of shrapnel on Right, right there. If you want to pass that around, I got any interest in it. This stuff in the plastic bag. Some, any of you here that have never seen shrapnel, I don't want you to look at that and feel it and imagine what that would do to human flesh. Glenn, would you hold it up in front of the uh, video camera? Yeah. There isn't much there to see. Really, it looks like a bunch of junk. But just to get an idea, there's a, there's a Japanese 25. They use a 25 caliber rifle. We used the 30 caliber the infantrymen did, and, and that's what uh, we carried, and, and that was a standard weapon. We went to a 30 caliber carbine. That's a Japanese 25 there. I mean, you can unzip it. Look at that, look at it, take it out. These are nothing that I'll pass around for you to see. These are native, native shell. That used to be a lot of trade. Trade sugar and little bacon and this and that and the other for that kind of stuff. The dog tag in there. That big piece of shrapnel, the one that went through my head. Through the head of my bed. And I, I was just, just it got out of there, thank God. And that afternoon, this afternoon, Tojo threw in a barrage and the 13, 13 of our men were hit in the electrical shop area. I ran over to see if I could be of any help, but about all I could do was to keep the flies off of them until they got them loaded onto a truck to send them back to base hospital. Several of them were wounded very seriously, but all were living. Several more were shell shot. They have been evacuating quite a few with shattered nerves. Another Corsair was hit and burned this morning and a gas dump was hit. If a, if a fellow, I have a little footnote here, if a fellow doesn't know how to pray, he soon learns at a time like this. Japs have been shelling us now for nine days. Some terrific fighting has been going on now and then up at the lines. We can hear the chatter of machine guns and the whoop of mortars day and night. The Nips threw a strong force of ground troops against the lines the other day, but our boys repulsed them and killed over a thousand Japs. That was that bonsai attack, Dick. Uh, their artillery as well as sheltered very hard to discern from the air and to knock them out with bombs and artillery. They have settled down now to a, an occasional barrage of four or five shells every three or four hours. And sometimes they'll lay off for seven or eight hours. <coughs> it's very nerve-wracking and over a hundred of our men have been sent out already with shattered nerves. My buddy that lives with me went the third day. They sent him out the plane. We've been lucky enough to have had no one in our outfit, in our own immediate outfit, killed yet, but many have been hit. And I don't know if that's true or not, because there were several that were wounded that looked to me like they wouldn't make it. But uh, a friend of mine saw one fellow get killed, 
another's arm blown off, and another with both feet blown off above the ankles. They tied clothes stops around the stumps to keep him from bleeding to death until they got him to the hospital. That happened behind her camp. I saw a heavy, I saw a piece of heavy tailgate chain cut in two this morning by a piece of shrapnel. It went on through the sideboard. One piece went through one eight ply tire and into the other duel on the same truck. The battery was cut almost in two. Luckily, no one happened to be in that truck. I, I have seen a couple of other trucks completely demolished by direct hits. I dread having to drive on or near the bomber or fighter strips. <coughs> you have happen to have a glass of water. Dry out. <coughs> Glenn, what what when you make these runways? Uh, what type of material will you end up with for uh, for a runway? Uh, uh, that's a real good question. They uh, they run a grade. They they, they they use cats and they eat cats and they cut the jungle and, uh, and then they use motor graders. They had big motor graders. I mean the CVs had a lot of equipment over there and uh, the best and. Uh, they run a grade on that, and with Bougainville, that was sort of a, of a sand or clay. And so they make that mat, and then they use a steel, I imagine it's 10 gauge, uh, with slots in one side, that it's about a 10 foot by 3 foot strip that two men can handle pretty easy, and two men lay. And they, they, they drop those ears on one side, and slots on the other. They drop those ears down into those slots and they just drop the drop the mat and it locks. Nothing can ever get it apart unless you take it back up. Same way you put it down. <coughs> and that and that uh, is what those you can imagine the, the thousands and thousands of tons of steel shipped over there to make those airstrips with. Uh -huh. And uh, on the on the uh, on the each head I believe Open now, I believe that one was just a coral strip. That coral is a living organism, and they mine it, and uh, just like they do the stone here, oh. and they make roads and that sort of thing out of it. And it's, they roll it, it's really damp when they put it down, wet. It makes almost like a concrete paper. Yeah, and you mentioned the Higgins boat. What is the Higgins boat? The Higgins boat is nothing but a landing uh, craft that they take men in when they hit the beach and it hit the, 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 the uh, ramp in the front drops down. It's not a big boat. Was it Higgins the old thing of the manufacturer? I imagine so. I, I suppose so. I don't know. Uh, If you've ever seen the pictures of wave after wave of Marines hitting the big beach, a lot of them are going to take the Higgins boats. And the high sides and so forth. I won't go into that until I'm talking getting in an area that I don't know what it's about. Uh, our boys out there on the repair and maintenance crews certainly deserve a lot of credit. I took a crew out there the other morning, just let them off and turned around to come in when one hit the middle of the strip, the steel mat, the fire flew in all directions. It struck about 150 yards ahead of us. I just, <clears throat> I lost no time in getting out of there. It is supper time now and the last shells that struck this area were thrown in after early chow this morning. More are all about due. They generally fire on us about chow down. I suppose that they think they can catch us away from the shelter and that we are more congregated at, at that time, which is true. You might be wondering why instead of uh, hands-on or combat or whatever, that the Japs were back there in the hills shelling us. Well, they had, they were dug in to, in fact, one 
about we could, within sight of us, we could see the flash of the gun when he, when he shot. A uh, 16-inch Navy gun, they said. And he was back there in the side of the Torquino Mountain in a cave, and he ran that gun out on the railroad, on, on the tracks. And he'd run it out, and he'd fire, and back in he'd go. Well, they'd get up there, and those torpedo bomber fighters would get up there and drop that gas and incendiary bombs and everything. He was back in far enough that as soon as it cooled off out there, he'd be back out there shooting at you again. And uh, it took some doing to get here. But <clears throat> this morning, at dawn, I took a crew of operators to the bomber's trip. We were going down the taxiway hell bent, and I saw a flame shoot out about 200 feet in the air, quite a ways in front, and to the right of me in the direction of camp. An explosion that followed had a terrible concussion to it. I pulled over and stopped, but didn't have a man left on the truck. They'd all bailed out. Several sprained limbs were the result. When I got back to camp, gas was running over the ground around the transportation area, and we had to move the trucks. Our pontoon gas tank had been punctured by a large piece of shrapnel. The Japs had thrown a six-inch shell into a bomb dump across the road from camp, and bomb fragments were picked up in our camp, weighing up to 14 pounds. Uh, only one man was injured. He was struck in the back. He uh, was eating breakfast. <coughs> the Japs shelled us again the last two days after having laid off for almost three weeks. This is April 11th. The barrages were light and no damage was reported. The, uh, you can tell when I write this trivial, when I wrote this trivial stuff, nothing had happened. <laughs> but uh, the Japs were in a garage at about 10 o'clock. It's April 13th, last night. We were playing blackjack when I heard the first, heard the first shell was over. I dove for cover and split my head on a chair. A gas dump was hit. And that they don't give purple hearts for that. And, uh, so that was my injury extent of it. By this time the Japs had practically exhausted their ammo and manpower. Their supply lines were cut off after the capture of Rabaw, New Britain. It caused us no more trouble on Bougainville until we pulled out from New Caledonia for a rest period before returning to the good old USA on a 30-day leave at home. I thank God for our victory at Bougainville, <coughs> Cabal, Iwo Jima, and so on. All those are stepping stones to Japan and the victory which will avenge the lives that were taken of the brave men from Pearl Harbor to Saipan. The 36th Naval Construction Battalion was shipped to New, Maya, New Caledonia after, and after two weeks of rehabilitation, we embarked for the USA. We arrived in Camp Parks near Oakland, California in late May and were given 30-day leave. It was great to be home again. After leave, I returned to Camp Parks via a two-week stay in Quonset Point, Rhode Island. I spent 10 days in the Naval Hospital at Shoemaker, California for surgery and then was shipped to Saipan via Hawaii and the Marshall Islands. Uh, we had quite an experience. We weren't supposed to stop at Pearl, but we had engine trouble. We had, we had it was on one of those old, the David Gaylord, I never will forget it, one of those old Liberty ships, the Kaiser manufactured. And I mean, he threw them together. I don't know how they stayed afloat. Some of them did. But anyway, that's, we had, we had engine trouble, and I guess uh, they told me a boiler, I don't understand engine rooms on ships, but they told me a boiler went out. They repaired it. We got out of Pearl about three days, and uh, we was out there, and uh, the thing conked out. We lost all our power, and we were dead in the water. And uh, they had a generator or what on there, but they made radio contact back to Pearl, and all that I could think of was them Jap submarines out there. We, we knew they were out there, we didn't know where, but we were an easy target, but nothing happened. 
they towed us back into Pearl. We stayed a couple week, more weeks and got fixed up, and then we, then we took off and we went to, to through the past the marshals and stopped there for for a little bit and just went ashore and, and loaded up and went to Saipan. And Saipan had been a hot spot there. I, I don't know just how much action or what went on there, but when we got there. It was secure. There was no, uh, no, no action there. I, Arnold, I, I, I trained new recruits there, kids 17, 18 years old. Uh, I'd said before the average age was 37, but they, they were getting, I mean, by that time, they were needing people. And they were putting some of those boys in there. And every one of them was trained. And I, my job was to go with them across the island. And Saipan is a, it's, it's just a mountain. It's up and down from beach to beach. Well, it's hairpin turns all the way. And you're, you're looking down and I had a school bus driver. And I had one boy, he said, uh, you know, he said, uh, mate, I've been uh, I'm always reaching for that air. He said, I'm not used to this one. I watched him real close. <laughs> we, got, we, got, we got, went up out of the coral pit, and we got up and we made about 30 or four of these tight bands and all the time on this side. And we we look down. And that northwest crane down there, the drag line got to be about this big. And he went to shift gears, and I told him, don't shift until you get on flat, you get on a flat surface. Don't shift, you've got a heck of a load on here. Well, he double clutched, and he, he shifted, and he hit nothing but gear, and couldn't get it in anything. And there we was, and on my side was the side that I was <laughs> looking down. At. And somehow, there was another truck come up behind us. And I tell him, I said, hold this thing. If it gets, if, if, you, if you can't get it into the back, get it into that bank, and it starts down, don't come this way. I'm over here. And uh, truck came up behind us. And I motioned for him to come on. And he put his bumper against us. And it gave him a chance, give him a chance to get that thing in grandma. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's, that's kind of scary. But we're getting pretty well to the end of this thing. How much time have we got? It'll be shutting me off here pretty quick. <laughs> well, in Saipan, we went to Okinawa. And I don't have near near the stuff, I hope you're thankful for that, on Okinawa that I had on Bougainville because I was one of the lucky ones on Okinawa. I unloaded with a load of men, I had a load of men loaded on my stake body truck at 2 o'clock in the morning on the invasion of Okinawa. We drove, we drove off of this LST and we didn't know where in the heck we were going. We just headed out. Follow that guy. You couldn't show a light. And we drove and we drove and we drove through a couple of those little native Okinawan villages. We were looking around all the time for somebody to be shooting at you. But it didn't happen. And we were there for, I don't know. Quite a little while we were through the through the awful typhoon they had there, and the things that I had a grandstand seat to that kamikaze attack. We heard Bob Conlon talking about the other night. We could see it, see, it, see the the Buckner Bay, that part of it, and the Japanese had their funeral for their pilots before they went to homeland. And they were going to die for the rising sun. 
kamikaze about and told you what it meant the other night. It means just the idea of giving their life, that it was glorious to die for the emperor and for their country. Which to me is a crock. I, <laughs> I can't see it that way. But they made it awful rough on us. And then they, 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 that one uh, or kamikaze attack, I had a picture in Find them of a little of a bomb, which is about equivalent to a, a maybe a seven or eight hundred pound bomb, loaded with explosives and a cockpit in it and controls, no engine. That guy's cut loose from a Betty bomber and he comes down and he hits a vulnerable spot on a on a ship and a, and a lot of them scored. They they shot about fifty percent of them out of the air. I saw them exploding in the air just. It says Okinawa's play a clay with the Japanese suicide back of bombs in the harbor, which were man steered, whose pilot's funeral was conducted before he left the mainland of Japan. He would be dropped from a bomber and then attempt to guide his load of explosives into a vulnerable spot in one of, the, of our ships. Our gunners shot over 50% of them out of the air before they could reach their target. During one raid by these bombs, 24 of our men were killed and, and several wounded in the harbor just below our camp. I said 24 of our men, they were Americans. They were people that they were bringing in off of the ships and, and uh, lining them up on the beach with all the stretchers and their blankets over them. And there was, there was at that particular there was there were 36 ships, vessels of all kinds that were that were sunk that day, and I did didn't gather statistics. Well, we did none of us did while we were over there on casualties and so forth. So I took a little. I made a stop over the library for about a half an hour yesterday afternoon and I was amazed at how many people and how many casualties there were on Okinawa because I was where I was where the where it wasn't you know and, uh, August the 1st 1945 US troops and all Navy and Air personnel were outfitted and on standby we weren't informed at that time but knew better knew later that it was intended to hit the mainland of Japan with everything we had. Uh, on August 6th, 1945, the atomic bomb was dropped on the Japanese city of Hiroshima. They called it Hiroshima. Three days later, another atomic bomb was dropped on Nagasaki, Japan. <coughs> the aftermath of these bombs was devastating. And five days later, the Japanese government accepted unconditionally the terms of the Potsdam Conference and Potsdam Declaration. And after almost four years of bloody war, the conflict flicked in the Asiatic Pacific was ended. By early October 1945, I was on my way home on the USS Oakland. I will never forget, uh, we come out on a point system, and I had, uh, I had two dependents at home. And uh, that counted towards your points that you could be discharged and get out on. And they had it on a big bulletin board, a big board, down at the chow hall. And every day we checked those points. You'd, keep, you'd move up a little bit. I don't know, I had around 35 points or whatever it took to get me out. And, uh, so the ones that were eligible, the ones that could go, went over to the personnel office and they had our, they had our service records ready. And uh, we'd take our service records and everything we had, get on one of these Higgins boats and go out to the ships that were going to take us home. We were assigned to the USS Oakland. It's a light cruiser, anti-aircraft cruiser, regular Navy, of course. And, 
I never forget looking up at that those fellows on the rail and they were all welcoming us, you know, and we got we got uh, turkey and we got ice cream and we got what do you like? What do you like? Just order. Of course that wasn't quite the way it was, but they did. They had everything imaginable to eat, fresh stuff. And we had a very enjoyable trip. Oh. I, my final comments. I, I'd like to make a comment on the <coughs> atomic bomb and its its effect on this whole country and on its on the war. <coughs> I have heard comments that we owe the Japanese people an apology for dropping them such a terrible, terrible, devastating piece of bomb. But had they not dropped the atomic bomb when they did, very shortly we would have hit the mainland of Japan without a doubt. Because according to the Potsdam Declaration, we declared that the Japan would be devastated, completely wiped off the face of the earth if they didn't surrender. And as I said, everybody died for the emperor, but I think the emperor thought that the next atomic bomb would probably be dropped on the palace or Tokyo. And I think that changed his mind. Everybody died for him, but he didn't, he wasn't ready to die that way. And I think that I'd better get off of here and give my comrade back there a chance. <clears throat> I, I, do, I did, as I say, take a few notes from the reference guide to the U.S. military history 1919 to 1945. Uh, pages over here at that, in the library are pages 93 and 104. And I'm sure your students have the same book at the library. Um, I want to ask you a question. Were you aware of the controversy over the Enola Gay display at... Yes, Christmas I was Day? going to mention that. I was going to mention that and I figured I'd said enough. Uh, the Enola Gay was the first, was the plane that dropped, B-29, that dropped the atomic bomb on Hiroshima. And a short time back, I didn't follow it very closely. It made me sick. They had a protest group in this country that protested uh, preserving the Enola Gay in the museum. And it, they got the job done. I, I understood they showed part of it. Is that right? That's the way I understand. I, they I showed really, part of it. Yeah. They, but there they, should be no shame attached by anyone in this country that, that enjoys the privileges of living in this country that should be, be no shame and, and to, 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 to keep them from, from showing that as a historical memory because it was necessary. As I said once, before and here war is dirty, it's bloody, and it's insane, but it's necessary. And, the, and had had the Japanese not pulled the, the, the attack on Pearl Harbor, uh, I've sailed past, and I'm sure that many of you here have saw the battleship Arizona sunk at Pearl Harbor and there's 1,200 men yet entombed in that Arizona yet today and it's a national shrine. Uh, had they not did that to us, there would have been no atomic bomb. It would have never happened. 
So, I mean, hold your heads up. We don't owe anyone anywhere an apology. That's all I got to say. Atomic bombs, <laughs> if the Japanese had had the atomic bomb and we did not, Pester County yeah, and Historic we Society, Cal Gray will present a program of World War II era music. The music the Home Front, the Armed Services Front, the public's invited. I don't know what day of the month or what day of the week the 14th is, but uh, it's a 7 p.m. program. I wouldn't be surprised if there's an announcement in the local newspaper. But uh, any of you who know Al Gray, and I'm sure most all of us do, know that you can count on a very fine evening of entertainment. It's on Tuesday. Yeah. Thank you. And it's a Christian church. Is that right? Yes. Well, that's right. <laughs> okay. I thought it would be at the uh, Historical Society building. I should read between the At the beginning of this series, I uh, said I had one great disappointment in trying to get participants. And that disappointment was that uh, I had not been able, at that time, to find somebody from the Marine Corps who had been in on Pacific Island invasions. You may recall that some of the men I contacted were not physically able. Some could not talk about it. And I think it was at the end of the second meeting, Bernard Hannon came up to me and said, uh, Phil, if you want a Marine, why don't you ask Dick Hannon? Maybe he would participate. I did ask Dick, and he readily agreed to participate tonight. Dick's a Marine Corps veteran, resident of Rensselaer. Dick, are you a native of Rensselaer? No. You're not. <laughs> I was born and raised in Port Disney. Here's a Port Disney. Okay. But you're a wrestler taxpayer. Yes. Yes, that's <laughs> it. Let me introduce Dick Hamlin. I don't know quite where to start. I was in the 3rd Marine Division, 12th Marines, who made landings on Bougainville, Guam, and Iwo Jima. And I'm going to start where we, where we left off a little bit ago, with the atomic bomb. I was in Philadelphia when the bomb was dropped. I was going to a radio school. And all the radio operators out of the 3rd Division we're going to school there. We didn't know why. We found out after the atomic bomb was dropped that we were preparing to join our old operation, which would have been the third division, pending the invasion of Japan. Now, I came across this here a while back. It was called Operation Downfall. And if it hadn't been for the atomic bomb, The first step in downfall was Operation Olympic. And it would have included 550,000 men. The second one was Operation Coronet, which if Olympic had succeeded, it would have been in as many as 28 divisions. And it was estimated we'd, we would suffer somewhere around half a million casualties. Because the Japanese were set up to intercept us wherever we landed. One of the things that was chronicled, that when the first American troops landed on 
Japanese soil, the first thing they were going to do was to execute every prisoner they had. And they held at that time, uh, I don't know the exact number, somewhere around 40 or 50,000 American prisoners. <laughs> so that for the atomic bomb. Now let's start from the beginning. <clears throat> I was a kid in a small high school up near the port in, near Westville, Indiana. Graduated in 1940, and how I wound up in the Marine Corps, I don't know. <laughs> Except we had a man by the name of Noble Raylander. He was sheriff of the county at that time. He'd been a Marine in World War I, and, and he was acting as kind of a recruiting sergeant. So before we had to register for the draft, there were three or four of us that signed up in the Marine Corps. And I started going with my wife, uh, and she's here tonight. And she was a cheerleader on a basketball team. We had a senior class that had 22 people in it. And she uh, brought me through uh, several years in the South Pacific uh, because she didn't write me a Dear John letter. <laughs> But our first day in boot camp, we got on a train in Indianapolis and went to San Diego. I had asked for duty in Paris Island because I thought it was closer to Port Indiana than San Diego was. So according to military custom, I went to San Diego. <laughs> and we were met at the station by an old Marine drill sergeant. He was too old to participate in war, but he had a but he had hash marks from his from here up to his elbow, and a hash mark designates four years in the service. And he met us at the station. He said, uh, "What a sorry-looking sight you guys are." <laughs> <laughs> he said. You wouldn't make a pimple on a Marine's butt. He, he, he didn't say butt. <laughs> so we went on to boot camp, and I'll read you a little thing here that uh, the Art Book Bookwald wrote. I don't know if any of you remember Art Bookwald or not. I didn't know he was a Marine until I got this. Somebody sent it to me, and this was. He said, there are fathers and father figures. Sometimes the father figure plays more of a part in your life than your father. My father was a good man and a kind man. And my father figure was something else again. We first met at Paris Island at 4 o'clock in the morning, still in civilian clothes, and lined up a group of young men who were thrown together by patriotism, duty, and maybe the movies to the shores of Tripoli. <laughs> and Bernardi stopped in front of me and he said, who is your father? And I told him, Joseph Buchwald of Queens, New York. He said, no, he is, and I'm your father. And I will be your father for the next 10 weeks. Is that clear? And he said, yes, father. He said, not father, it's sir. You will call me sir. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir, then you're going to love me because I'm going to love you like no father has ever loved his son. Is that clear? And I said, yes, sir. How many push-ups did your father make you do each day? He said, I said, none, sir. Well, I'm going to make you do 50 push-ups a day. Do you know why? No, sir, because that's what the father is for, to make a son into a man. You're a miserable excuse for a physical specimen. Only a father like myself could believe he could make a bag of bones like even a Marine. Do you love me? And I said, yes, sir. <laughs> Good, now hit the deck and start doing push-ups. <laughs> and I fell down that right after 10. <laughs> he said, how, how can you say you love me when you won't grant me a little favor like doing 50 push-ups when I ask you? <laughs> I don't know, sir. I mumbled with my head in the dirt. Get back in line, he said in disgust. And it wasn't the first time I disappointed, disappointed him. 
Seems every day I do something to upset our father-son relationship. I wanted to please him in the worst way, but I didn't know how. When he made me a bed in the morning, he tore it up and threw the sheets and blankets on the floor, and when I talked to him, he made me scrub the head with a toothbrush. <laughs> and when he didn't like the way I crawled on my stomach in the mud, he made me march with a full pack and rifle around the barracks all day. Every, every time he punished me for the slightest infraction, he asked if I still loved him, and I always said I did. <laughs> on a 20-mile hike, we were given one canteen of water to last the entire trip. I drank mine in the first 10 miles. <laughs> Bernardi was very sympathetic and told me if he wasn't my father, he'd give me more. <laughs> then he kicked me in the pants and said, now get moving or else I'll kick your butt for the next 10 miles. <laughs> Bernardi woke me up in the morning and put me to bed at night. Then he'd inspect my rifle and make me get out of bed and clean it again. And so it went, that ten, week, 10 weeks seemed like 10 years, because he never left my side. Then we said goodbye and I vowed I would forget him as soon as I left Paris Island. That was 42 years ago at this time when he wrote this, I think. Art Buchwald has been dead several years. But he said, I seem to remember him. What is really weird is that when I look back on the role he played in my life, I really do love him. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the beginning of a combat wound. <clears throat> and then we were then we were assigned to radio school in San Diego. I don't know how they pick people to go where they do, but they do. And we were in communications. We also had other duties to perform, like learning hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, naval procedure and operation. And we got out of that, and we were given a little furlough for 10 days. In those days, you traveled by rail. You didn't fly. So it took us six days on the road <laughs> from San Diego to Chicago and from Chicago back. <laughs> so we actually had about four days, I guess. And I reported back to Camp Dunlap in California, where they had brought part of the 10th Marines out there, and we formed what they called the 12th Marines, so the, the 12th Marine Regiment. And that's where we started from. Then we got ready to go overseas. We got on board a ship called the Bloemfontein. In those days, most of the material and supplies were going to the European theater. Now the Bloom Fountain stands for Flower of the Sea. And she was an old Dutch freighter. She was commissioned in Amsterdam, flew a flag of the Netherlands, had a Dutch and Javanese crew. Very few, my, few of them could speak English. Our bunks were in the holds where they piped air down to us. Most of us tried to sleep up on deck if we could. And the heads were on the port and starboard side of the ship that had uh, running water down a trough that went out into the sea. So you sat down over a two before <laughs> and had salt water showers. <laughs> and the food wasn't too good. And I think sometimes the, the water from these heads came back to the showers. <laughs> Did you ever wash your hair in a saltwater shower? <laughs> but it took us 17 days to get to New Zealand without escort. We zigzagged through some of the roughest seas you'd ever seen, that I've ever seen. Of course, I was a Midwestern flatlander. <laughs> but we were welcomed with open, ar open arms in New Zealand. The people down there were friendly. We were billeted in a New Zealand army camp. In those days, most of the New Zealanders and Australians, soldiers, were gone. They were with, with the English up in North Africa. And there had been a lot of fear that Japanese would come down through the, 
through the trough and hit Australia and New Zealand. And we were welcomed with open arms. And we did some training there. We were in a town called Wangaree. We landed in Auckland. We were in a little town called Wangaree. One of the first things we discovered when we got there, there was a little restaurant in town called the Ferns. <coughs> They served delicious meals. You could get a steak of eggs and chips, and they put a pitcher of milk on your table with a loaf of bread and, and butter in a pound dish, and it cost you 47 cents. <laughs> but that didn't last long because you know how Americans are. The waitresses were making more money than the owner was. And we'd pay 47 cents for the meal and tip the waitress a dollar. So we soon started to raise prices. <laughs> so from New Zealand, we... Oh, another thing I remember about New Zealand were the hikes. They called them conditioning hikes. You carried a transport pack, you had a sack of raisins and rice and some old salt pork. And you'd go out, the first, first one was for 10 miles, the next for 20. And the next one was for 30 miles, and we were out for two days. <coughs> but then, with the ingenuity of American troops, we started raiding farmers' chicken coops. <laughs> yeah. And taking a few rails off the fence to barbecue. <laughs> So, so anyhow, the old man corralled us one morning after we were out at one of these forays. His name was Colonel John Bushrod Wilson. How he ever got the name of Bushrod, I don't know. But he was a graduate of Virginia Military Institute, was a career Marine. He said, now gentlemen, there's going to be a suit on you guys stealing stuff. But I think we can forestall it. If each of, of, of you would divvy up a dollar, we can pay these farmers for what? <laughs> so that's the way we got around that. <clears throat> and then we had to have a driver's license. I was a radio man, a communicator. <coughs> Communication personnel, we were called. And we had Jeep with radios on him, so we had an old boy who was a master sergeant in the motor pool. His name was Pompovich. <coughs> and he took Jack Kearns and I out one morning for a ride to see if we qualified for a license. <laughs> so I was driving on the way out, and there was a farmer along the ride, along the road, and was out working in his field, and he waved at us, and I waved back at him. And he just gave me hell. He said, you know, you were driving a United States vehicle. If you wreck it, keep your hands on the wheel. <laughs> so on the way back, Jack was driving. No Pankovich, he was of Russian descent. And he thought, well, I'm not going to make the same mistake that Dick did. <laughs> so we came past the same farm, and the guy waved, and Jack didn't. He said, courage, you bubblehead. You know, we are from a foreign country, and we're supposed to keep good communications. <laughs> but this Pankovich was a good character. He had been with the Marine Corps for years. He had held a light heavyweight title championship with Chinese Marines and the Asiatic Fleet. And he said, now you guys, he said, if you'll meet us down, meet me down at the slop chute tonight, you can buy me a beer. <laughs> so the next day we got our license. <laughs> <coughs> so then we left to New Zealand and we left for Guadalcanal. Oh, another story I have to tell you. The fifth and sixth Marines were in Auckland. And they were on R and R from the from the 1st Division, from the Guadalcanal campaign. 
In the 5th and 6th Marines, they wore the French Porger on their shoulder, which was a, a French decoration from World War I. It was a braid that they wore on their left shoulder. But they had corralled all the girls and often. So somebody got the bright idea and passed the word around that anybody who wore this braid had venereal disease. Because <laughs> <laughs> they had corralled all the girls. <laughs> caused what they call the Battle of Queen Street in Hoffman. <laughs> and somebody suggested that we should have been offered a battle star, <laughs> but it never was issued. <laughs> but anyhow, we went, left New Zealand, and we landed on Guadalcanal. Guadalcanal was pretty well secured at that time, but we helped with some of the mop-up operations. And somebody asked the other night uh, how the natives treated us on these islands. Well, the natives of these islands had been butchered and made slaves of by the Japanese for years, and they were great friends of ours. But most of them were hidden up in the hills. First one I saw, when we were going back to our camp on what they call the Coconut Grove, about a canal and years ago was a owned by a British company, Palomar P Company. And our camp was under these coconut trees. And here comes a native along. He had a machete in his hand. He had a Japanese head in his hand with the blood still running out of it. And he went to ship stores and he traded that head in for, I forget if he got a combat jacket or some clothing or tobacco in exchange. But the natives were very good friends of ours. <laughs> so we did some training and mop up on Guadalcanal. And then we started training for a combat operation. Nobody knew where it was going to go except our commanders. When you get on board a ship, you don't know where you're going to go. You've got all your combat gear. I forget the name of the ship, I think it was a Crescent City. But we landed in Empress Augusta Bay on Bougainville. And I always said, I wish, I told Glenn, I think, one time, I wish the Seabees would have landed first and built us a road. <laughs> <laughs> but when you go down a cargo net on a on an ocean freighter, and try to step into a Higgins boat, and you've got 75 pounds on your back. And the ship don't always uh, roll the same way the landing boat does, or the Higgins boat, or landing craft. You have to be careful about getting in. <laughs> you might get your legs crushed. <laughs> but you go down a cargo net with your cartridge belt open, so in case you fall in, you can slip out of your your harness so you won't drown. <laughs> so anyhow, Bougainville was quite an experience. They started hitting us about the time we got to the beach. You know, D plus one, if the Japanese would have, would have counterattacked, they could have driven us back in the sea because we didn't have enough ammunition, supplies, ashore yet to maintain an all-out war, but they didn't. Now, the Japanese were kind of a ferocious kind of fighter. They didn't care much about human life. They'd strap themselves up in trees, snipers would. They didn't care if they were killed or not, but if they could kill a couple of you before you got them, it was all right with them. They died for the emperor. So we made sure a lot of them died for the emperor. <laughs> but I think it was D plus five that the sea beast came in. Remember George Christie and I were up on an, on an FO position directing artillery along the Piva River. There had been a heavy rain. Bougainville was a heavy jungle type area. 
in the perimeter we're in, perimeter we were in. And you waded in mud up to your knees. You didn't have enough food to eat. But George and I stepped back, and there'd been a heavy rain that night, into the Peaver River. And we we're brushing our teeth. <laughs> and a couple of Japanese bodies came floating by us and were washed out of caves. Up. <laughs> so we forgot about brushing our teeth. <laughs> so we were on Bougainville from the 1st of November till sometime in January when we pulled out. And we went back to our rest area. They called it R&R &R back to Guadalcanal which was pretty well secured at that time. And they had set up a reasonable area for us to live in. Some of the rear echelon had even made us some raisin jack. <laughs> we had a party with. <laughs> but then all of a sudden things started to tighten up again. And we got on board a ship headed for Guam. But we didn't get there right away. The 2nd and 4th Division were making a landing on Saipan, and they needed more help than they, than they might be expected. We took part of our task force away from us. So here the old 3rd Division was just sitting out there floating on the sea, and we sat there for 58 days. <laughs> Until we got back, and I think in here is a another thing that went on during that time was the Battle of the Philippine Seas. They called it the Great Marianas Turkey Shoot. Admiral Mark Mitcher's task force 58 met the enemy and succeeded in destroying more than 400 Japanese aircraft. Sinking three of their carriers and two oilers. Four other carriers, a battleship and a cruiser and a destroyer, and another oiler were badly damaged. So that needs to the situation along of getting replaced for the Japanese to get replaced and then they landed on Guam. Now when you make a landing, Guam was the only one that I had this kind of treatment on. The Zebra 200 on D-Day, the Navy called out Reveille. And they fed the troops of steak and eggs. It was kind of like a last supper. <laughs> <laughs> It was good, but it was, some of us had a hard time digesting it because we knew what was coming up. <laughs> so we went back and got our combat gear on, and a chaplain comes up and reads a prayer. It's kind of like absolution before you go over the side. <laughs> <laughs> into our landing boats. And by this time, out of 90 of us, of the original core of communication personnel, there were 40 of us left after two campaigns. Of course, we had replacements. They always maintained that you need replacements. And it was on Guam, and a friend of mine wrote this book. Jack Kerrins. It was the last major bonsai by the Japanese during World War II. Some 9,000 enemy troops. In a bonsai attack, they use walking wounded, they are sacked up, they have TNT packs on their back. Very few of them have rifles or ammunition. They are sent in to try to destroy uh, enemy opposition. 
get into guns and sights, gun emplacements. But I remember that morning, uh, we were on a ridge. There were three of us, uh, Bob Ignatius, John Wiley, and myself, and several others down the line. And, and uh, we thought we heard something coming up the side of the, the, side of the hill. I think it was Bob leaned over to Ignatius and said, John, he said, there's a chap down there. And Bob leaned over and said, well, shoot the son of a bitch, eh? <laughs> <laughs> so we did. We leaned over. And all we had was a big explosion. The guy had a TNT pack on his back, but it woke up the whole neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the got through. You know, as far as the Marine Corps and the Japanese were concerned, uh, a lot of us had made up our mind that we would never be taken prisoner. We would fight to the end because we knew how we'd be treated. So then Guam let up. <coughs> And we made our permanent base there. And it was during that time we started training again. And we didn't know for sure what was coming up. But I came down with a tactical. The Japanese weren't our only enemies on those islands. There was Anopheles mosquitoes, which caused malaria. There was dengue fever. <coughs> there was one said that it took seven men to keep one man on the line. <coughs> And I came down with the attack of malaria and yellow jaundice. And I was sent to a base hospital. And some of the guys come to see me and I started giving my gear away. Some I didn't think I needed because I was going back to the States. Some of my friends, you know, you had an extra pair of khaki or something. Or... But anyhow, I got well. <laughs> and I was sent back to duty and I had to go collect all this. <laughs> so it was then we started to make the probably one of our most energetic uh, tours of duty. We did a mop up on the island of Guam. And it was in training for another invasion. <coughs> we didn't know where it was going to be, but we knew it was coming. So again, we loaded up our gear and on board a ship. I don't remember what the name of the ship was. I think there's some names in here. That... And we cruised along <coughs> for several weeks, not knowing where we were going, but it was Iwo Jima. <coughs> And I always remember a guy by the name of Colonel Fairborn. He was our intelligence officer. He called us up on deck, and we had a critique with communication personnel and so on. He said, now, gentlemen, this will be our objective. And he named the beaches and so on where we should be in our communication personnel and where our placement should be. He said, we will take this objective to the last man. That was encouraging. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, have to, I'll have to go forward a little bit. Colonel Fairborn was supposed to have been a, he retired as a major general in the Marine Corps. And several years ago, we had a reunion down at Larry Bird's Boston Connection. And he was supposed to have been the speaker, but he passed away three or four months before he got there, but his wife came. And talking to his wife, he said, you know, Bill always loved you, boys. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, yes, he did. <laughs> but you learned early in the campaign there were dead bodies all around you. Whenever you 
went into a foxhole and there was a dead Japanese, or you thought he was dead, you put it around the back of his head, because he might be there with a, with a grenade here. Here a couple of years ago, I was at a, at a dinner we had down in Bradenton, Florida. They called it Survivors of Iwo Jima. And there were about 70 or 80 people there, including our wives and some friends. And there was a Navy man there who had been in on the bar 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 bombardment of Iwo Jima, telling how he helped shell the island. Somebody stood up and said, you missed. <laughs> <laughs> and it seemed like they did. <laughs> because on Iwo Jima, we lost 10,000 people in three Marine divisions. We killed 22,000 Japanese. On an island that was, on our landing beaches, it was a half mile wide, seven and a half miles long. Surabachi was on one end, it kind of curly cued around. So there were 30,000 dead people on that island. That's about five times the population of Rensselaer. But anyhow, when we, when the island was secure, oh, down with the survivors of Iwo Jima, there was a, there was a General McCarthy. He was a colonel in those days. He was in charge of 24th Marines. And he was called Jumpin' Joe McCarthy. <laughs> but he had won a Congressional Medal of Honor, and he wore that around his neck at that party. <laughs> so. When they took us off of Guadalcanal, or Iwo Jima, <coughs> we were coming back home on an LST. Bob Conley was talking about the LSTs. And they're a flat bottom thing, and it wasn't loaded except with troops. They had brought supplies in and tanks and so on. And they ride like a I can't explain how they read. <laughs> but the first night we were on board that thing, when you go down the mess hall, you go down a ladder. And the kind old Navy served as greasy old chili. <laughs> and to get up on deck, you had to crawl back up this ladder, and some of us didn't make it. <laughs> the deck below the ladder was was pretty stinky. <laughs> but anyway, we got back to Guam, which was our... Iwo Jima was, had three airstrips in it. Two of them were complete and had to be repaired, of course. The third one, the reason we needed Iwo Jima was for fire support for our, for our bombers off of Guam. And that's where the Flying Fortress, uh, the B-29s were coming from. They picked up their fighter support off of Iwo Jima to fly over Japan. <coughs> I always also remember a guy, an Air Force pilot, there was this party in, in Braden. He said, I want to thank you guys. He was flying a B-29 back from Japan. He had he had an engine out, and he lacked 700 gallon of fuel to get back to Guam. And he landed on one of those airstrips. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, thank you very much. <laughs> but anyhow, we got back to uh, Guam. And we had been there several days, wondering where we were going to go next. And they had a, had a USO sh troop show there. Betty Hutton was in it. Had a couple of lousy comedians and a, and a good, no-known band. But after the thing was over, uh, Betty Hutton came out and said, the General Erskine had granted me the pleasure of making this very special announcement. The rotation plan is in effect for those of you who are veterans of three campaigns who have been over here at least two and a half years. 
But we had been there over two and a half years, and we had over three campaigns under our belt, and we were real happy about it. <laughs> so it didn't take long to we're processed and headed back to the States. We were on a ship, a Coast Guard ship. She had a 12-foot hole in her bow. <coughs> she hit her coral reef somewhere along the line, and they'd shorted it up and would bilge pumps were pumping water out of them. <coughs> but we had a lot of wounded on there from Iwo Jima. Some of us volunteered to carry food to them. And they were men in casts that, <coughs> that had been shot up. You know, it was smelly in there. You, you know how a wound, open wound with a cast on it starts to smell? <coughs> but I think they were glad to see us. But on our way to Pearl is when we heard that President Roosevelt had died. So we docked in Pearl Harbor and they took most of the wounded off, or badly wounded, and put it into a naval hospital on, on Pearl Harbor. Some inspectors came on board the ship and they didn't have room for her in dry dock in Pearl Harbor and decided it was good enough to go to San Diego. <coughs> so we rode it from there to San Diego. And then we got 30 day furloughs. The war wasn't over yet. I got home uh, somewhere around the 1st of May. My wife and I were married on the 9th of May, the day after VE Day. And my orders were after my leave. So Don and I got on a train in Valparaiso, Indiana, headed for Philadelphia. We didn't even know where we were going to stay, except for a the mother of a friend of mine had a friend up in Upper Darby, Pennsylvania, and said she'd put us up until we could find an apartment, which she did. They were very nice people, and their name were Doyle. And we did find an apartment in Philadelphia, and we reported <coughs> into the Marine Barracks at the Navy Yard, and found we were going to a communications school. And when we got there, we discovered that all the, most of the people in the 3rd Marines, the 3rd Division, most of the radio people were there. And we wondered why that was. And we never knew until the first bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. And then Big Boy was dropped on Nagasaki. and they started to muster us out. That happened in August. I think on September 7th, those of us that had enough points were discharged. But we never knew till afterwards why we were there. We were to rejoin our old groups to make the invasion on Japan. So we were very happy for the dropping of the atomic bomb. We probably wouldn't be here today. So that was the end of my days of service. So thank you for listening. A videotape to show. It lasts 38 minutes. We're going to run over time, and if you don't have the time, you're welcome to leave. But uh, we'll start the tape just as soon as we can get set up and get going here. This will be an interview with Tom Dumas. Tom is a Navy veteran a staff officer on Admiral Halsey's staff, communications officer, and it was um, Tom's experience to be aboard the battleship Missouri 
when the Japanese surrendered. In my pocket that I always carry a gun. You damn right, that's fire. Uh, this interview is uh, being held on the morning of June 30th, 1995. And uh, to begin this interview with Mr. Thomas Dumas, I'd like to express my thanks to you, Tom, for taking the time to do this, and uh, I'm sure a lot of people will be interested in your experiences in the military. Would, uh, would you tell me a little bit, please, about um, oh, your, your activities in 1941 and 42? Well, in 1941, I was a second year law student at Indiana University when Pearl Harbor occurred. And I was a graduate assistant in the School of Business and a second year law student. And on Sunday, Pearl Harbor Day, I'd been to church and I had an armload of blue books, examinations that Professor Lusk had given. And I, would, I intended to spend the day grading Professor Lusk's paper. And uh, got over to the law school, but uh, I can't remember the exact hour when people knew about uh, Pearl Harbor, but about the time it occurred, and one of the fellows said, uh, came into the library and said, well, fellas, this is it, you know. And he said, we'll all be in the military. So I put the stuff away, and, and uh, that was, that was uh, December the 7th, 1941. A couple weeks after that, maybe it was a month, could have been six weeks. My memory for things 50 years ago is the keenest. Uh, uh, a carload of us went to Indianapolis to sign up for the service. A couple of guys went to, wanted to be in the FBI and somebody else wanted to be in the Army. And I'd always wanted to be in the Navy, so I, I uh, signed up for the Navy for the V-7 program, which is what you are, you get 90 days of training and you come out an ensign, which is the equivalent of a second lieutenant. And uh, so I signed up and they said, go back to school, finish your law degree. I had, and so I did. They said, take uh, uh, college algebra and trigonometry, which I did while I was going to law school. That must have been a very heavy academic load with all that piled on your uh, well, law school. That time, Phil, we didn't study too hard. The war was on, everybody knew he was going in, and, and so we didn't get too darn excited yeah. about, about, uh, See you like here. <laughs> yeah, about uh, academics, but it was interesting. I hadn't done well in mathematics in high school, but I got along well with the, the people that taught me at the university, and, and I enjoyed it, kind of, because it's, it's such a different regimen than, than uh, study for law. So I did that and finished up my law school and on December the 13th or 14th or 15th of that same year, that had been 42, uh, graduated from law school. When I came home, my orders were waiting for 